You are listening to the Atlanta Real Estate Forum radio show, all about real estate edition. Shining a light on the movers and shakers in the real estate industry. The home builders, developers, realtors, and suppliers making it all happen. Good morning and welcome back to Atlanta Real Estate Forum Radio's All About Real Estate Edition. I'm your host, Carol Morgan, and I'd like to give a shout out to our show sponsor, Denim Marketing. Denim Marketing is the market leader in creating quality, original content for social media, public relations, marketing campaigns, blogging, and more. Today, I am pleased to welcome our next legend of real estate to the show, he is a household name in the industry and instrumental in shaping government affairs for the Atlanta Home Builders Association. A big welcome to George McClure, president of the McClure Company. Good morning. Or afternoon. Happy, yeah, happy to have you here. Um, so let's just dive in and talk a little bit about how you got into the home building business. <laughs> I grew up on a chicken farm. And that's what North Georgia, Cherokee County, I grew up in Cherokee County, was all about. I knew enough about that industry to know I didn't want to do it. <laughs> and I, I got a summer job while I was in high school working on my uncle's framing crew, the con carpenter. Loved it. Loved it a lot. It was physical. You, when you finish the day, end of the day, you had something to show for your work. And I did that for a couple of years. Went to, uh, that tore my knee up playing ball. And I needed, what can I do to make a living? And I'm watching the Atlanta Journal paper as I want to be, become an accountant. So I went to college to be an accountant, did that. And then my first job, they found out I was had experience in construction and accounting. They gave me all the construction clients. And Paul Duke, who we developed Peace Street Corners, hired me. And I did that. And then uh, one thing kind of led to another, and they went and worked for a big company that had several construction divisions, banking enterprises. We did that. And about 74, somewhere around there, I went in business for myself, which was my ultimate goal before I was in high school, even. Wow. And I wanted to have my own business. And, uh, actually, I wanted to own a little country store. And, Inside work, had air conditioning, you know, like yeah. get rid of and I went the completely opposite to construction. Your little country store, home building business, you know. Yeah, whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. And well, building houses led to shortage of couldn't find lots, so I developed my own subdivision. And <laughs> as they said, the rest is history. Oh my goodness. Well, you know, when you started a McClure company and I, I've seen the date of 1978 and you just threw out 74. So at some point in the 70s. I had a know, part in 74 partner in 74 okay and then I bought him out and did it all just me in 78 78 well what was that like talk a little bit about the 70s you know and and lots of our listeners you know weren't building then that's for sure so what was it like then 70s were crazy um interest rates were running rampant going crazy if you could get 17 18 percent interest uh, wow. you buy a mortgage, you're paying 16, 18% of mortgage, uh, in the early eighties. Also, uh, there were a lot of, in Atlanta market, there were a lot of small builders the, we didn't have the big pulties in the around, they were here, but they had no impact. A lot of builders building five, 10 houses a year. And that's kind of where I fit in. And it, it was, a, it was a struggle. It's hard to make, make money. Uh, you had to really, you know, you're out there, you're totally plywood yourself. And you're you and the builder next door are putting up batter boards to get we're helping each other out. So it was very hands-on kind of business. And then things grew and grew and things changed. Got to be more business-like. Small bankers saw an opportunity to make money. So they started financing builders and developers. And that's kind of where it took off. That was in the mid-80s. Uh, and we rode that wave until the, the last crash, 2008, that time frame. And now it's changed it going back to being all big builders and because there's no small banks around to take care of the little guys and there there's no capital right or if it is wow. it's extremely expensive so it, that, yeah absolutely the truth there well yeah. what types of homes did you build back in the 70s and talk a little bit about how that evolved i believe in the way to succeed is to find a niche mm -hmm. and a, another builder that i knew real well he kind of mentored me. I listened to him and he was building 
upscale first time buyer houses. Okay, I'm going after school teachers, policemen, sheriffs, deputies, those kind of guys. That was our market. And that has primarily been my market all the way through. Uh, one of the things that I did that most builders didn't do, I saved the trees and I built basements. Almost every house I had had a basement. We gave you expandable space so you could stick. A lot of my people in their houses 20, 30 years. Oh, absolutely. And it, uh, it, they could do that. And then uh, the trees, I, I think I'm a big believer in the land tells you what to do. I don't, I don't like mass grading. They all have their look a lot and they'll feel a lot. I like it. You go into one of my so the, town lake. I'm one of the developers at town lake. I did Rose Creek, Summer Chase, and Wellesley, and uh, the land plan and everything for them. And you ride through, and there's trees everywhere, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and I like that. I love that. Matter of fact, yeah. Summer Chase, I live in Summer Chase. I moved in here, needed a place to live, so I moved in 30 years ago. I'm going to stay two years, and I've been here, I've been here 30 years. <laughs> Ever since, yeah. Well, my I neighbor, completely well, My neighbors are that way. We've all been here that long. Yeah. It works out great. You know, I love trees and there's nothing like a stately old tree that's been there for oh, a yeah. while. You know, I, I live on a big farm and when we bought it, it had just been a giant field. So mm -hmm. we have trees around the edges, but there wasn't anything, you know, near yeah, the house here, or anything yeah. else. So everything that's here, we planted and been here 20 years, but you know, it takes 20 years for a tree to get big enough to be substantial. Yep. And of course, you know, we had the unfortunate incident a couple of weeks ago that one of my biggest trees got struck by lightning mm -hmm. and it was dead within three days. I'm still heartbroken over it, but I was mm -hmm. outside with horses. So yeah. I appreciate the tree for taking one for the team because it could have been me or a horse instead. I did a project in Louisiana a few years ago and uh, to move it, you didn't take the trees down, you moved them. You moved, wow. Twenty five to fifty thousand dollars per tree. Wow. But you did it because it really improved the value of the property. Mm -hmm. People uh, like the trees. Trees are beautiful. Yep. Well, talk a little bit about development. You know, talk, you, you mentioned that you got started in developing because you, you needed somebody to develop the lots for you. So right. when was that? And um, talk about some of your favorite projects. Uh, that was probably 88, eight, late 80s. Three of us built, three myself and three other builders. Actually, it was two to start with. We're building the same subdivision together and we're running out of lots. And where are you going to go next? Where are you going? What are you looking at? And we didn't like our answers. And we decided maybe we can team our lot buying capability together and do something. And we did. And we found a project that was in trouble. And we bought it out and went in there. And then we brought a fourth builder in uh, who, who was wanting to learn the business. So we brought him in, let him learn the business a little bit. And that, uh, like I said, I then went moved up to bigger and bigger subdivisions. I guess my biggest subdivision is well, Summer Chase is where I live. It's 210 lots. My, most of my, and I did stuff in Cobb County, Cherokee, Henry County, just kind of all over Atlanta, South County, been wherever uh, the market take. And I, I, I try to stay in that first time, move up first time buyer or that middle, middle income, main income people house. That's a nice niche. Well, it's yeah. interesting. I think a lot of builders got into development by necessity. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The problem with developing, I tell people it sounds crazy, but you're betting on the what the economy is going to be five years from now. You right. Put a, you put a piece of property in a contract. And by the time you bring it to, to market, sell the first lot, it can be three to five years. Easy. Easily. And maybe even more now. And the challenge yeah, exactly. now is you don't really want to put it under contract unless you know you can zone it. And it, well, zoning is a different issue altogether. That's a whole different nightmare, isn't it? Yeah. So, but once you, even if you do all that and interest rates are like, how would you like to have done that? Something coming on market six months ago before lumber started going crazy and interest rates are going crazy. Yep. And you've got all the carry costs on that. You know, if you're working oh. on development for five years, Merry Christmas, you've got a lot of money you're sinking into it. it no it, return it until you it start does. selling lots <laughs> or homes if you're the builder. It, or both, if you do both. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of a lot of build developers become builders because they can't sell the lots. So, Correct. Yep. yep. It's yep. interesting to see how that works. I think it goes. It gets gone both ways. It goes. Builders it goes both. Yep. I, I, I can go either way. Yeah. Yeah. I tell people you want me because I've already made all those mistakes. <laughs> well, that's how you learn. You learn from your exactly. mistakes if you're smart, right? right. Um, well, 
talk a little bit about codes, regulations, the political environment, all of that. How has those changed over the years? And I guess, what do you see as the biggest hurdles that face that, you know, that builders are facing today? Two or three questions there. I first know. Of all, first of all, how I got involved. I've always been one for knowing what the rules are mm -hmm. and knowing better than anybody else. Ball playing, experience, my coaches know what the rules are and you will beat them knowing the rules, fundamentals. And I got the same thing I, when I started building houses. I went and bought a code book. Mm -hmm. I was the only builder I knew that had a code book. Wow. And I used, I would argue with the county as inspectors. We were just starting then to inspect houses. Back before that, couple, just a couple of years before that, you bought a permit for $35, and I'm just so get it on the tax roll. And that was it. There were no inspections, no nothing. And FHA was doing a lot of stuff in the early in that time frame. So they came up with a bunch of rules and codes, things like that. And then they encouraged, they encouraged and helped. And I got, I guess because I was outspoken, got tagged to help with the codes. And uh, I'd argue with inspectors. And I tell people back in those days, I won more code arguments with a dictionary than I did with a code book. But uh, and then the county, we had a new county commission chairman, and he asked me to help him do development regulations hmm. or develop a subdivision. And at that time, the development regulations for Cherokee County was two pages. That's it. Oh, my goodness. What is it now? 50, 80, something like that. Yeah. yeah. But, and that's, every, that's zoning. That's everything. And we, we cheated. We went down to Cobb County, which I was doing some development down there. And they had their really good, good, good codes. And they've been a leader in that division, in that part of the business. And we worked with them to adopt regulations in Cherokee County that mirrored kind of what Cobb was doing. We modified it for Cherokee. And then I served on a couple of committees after that, with like a appeals board for developers and all that kind of stuff. But where, where I got involved, and I think you asked me about like the Home Builder Association, was just, I knew the codes. Mm -hmm. And I would argue the codes with somebody who didn't know the codes or somebody who thought they knew and didn't know. Right, yeah. That's crazy to think, you know. It, it, it is absolutely crazy. Well, we've got, we went from nothing to what we have today, which is kind of on the, you know, nothing wasn't enough. And what right. we have today is too much. It's too much. So, And you learn from going through the process. A lot of the codes are written and submitted and approved for manufacturers. Mm -hmm. If you want to get your product sold, get it put in the code. Right. Then everybody will buy it. Wow. So you had to fight that battle. And then again, again, inspectors who you got to know, go back to the code. Most of the codes, like it's span tables for lumber, strength of lumber. They have a hundred percent over uh, their safety cushion in them. Okay. So if you meet, if you're right there on the edge of what the span is, you still got hundred percent protection. The inspectors didn't know that. They oh, think wow. you have, they're, they're trying to put that on top of what you do. So anyway, and then I got into the, uh, trust manufacturing business and there we had to teach them all about trust manufacturing and codes and engineering and all that so i, I become sort of the go-to guy on codes and then most of the product i built has been on septic tank versus sewer mm -hmm. so i've gotten tapped by the state and i'm on i'm still on the what they call technical review committee which is a committee that writes the rules for septic tanks for the state of georgia on the state department of health I'm still on that. I have write the book. Literally, I'm one of the authors of the code, and I still serve on that committee. And I built a few sewer plants over the years. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so a trust company, sewer plants, you've developed, you've built. What have I not asked about? <laughs> uh, I had a mortgage company, had a real estate company, wow. which is kind of for my own business. And it, uh, that's enough, you know. That's a and, lot. Yeah, stay busy. Yeah. yeah, well, talk a little bit about your involvement with the Greater Atlanta Home Builders Association. You've served as president. You're a life director. You were honored with the President's Award. You've been honored with the Lewis Sinker Award. I know you've been incredibly involved and still are, but you talk about your favorite parts of that and really what you brought to the table. I think the favorite thing is how I got started. Okay. Uh, one of the time starting to build some houses, this is McClure Company. And looking for lots, found, found, found a subdivision, had some lots of lots, and I went and talked to the developer and I wanted to buy some lots. And he said, well, if you want to buy in here, you have to belong to the Home Builder Association. Mm -hmm. He was the local Cherokee chapter president. Said, okay, no problem. 
and they had a deal going on. If you join the Home Builder Association, you got a homeowner warranty how program for free. Hmm. The basic, basic two hundred fifty dollars a piece. They give you to pay for one. You got both. Right. So I signed up. Went to my first meeting, and it sounds crazy, but they were taking somebody needed somebody to take minutes, and they asked if anybody had a pen. <laughs> well, I always have a pen. I always have a pen and a lighter. I always. Did. I had a pen. So I said, I got a pen here. We here. You take the minutes. <laughs> that, I mean, you're voluntold. So we call I, that. I took, I, took, I took the minutes and took them home and topped them up so they looked pretty and everything. Gave them to them. And so you're great. You're our new tre- tre- uh, secretary. You secretary go. becomes treasurer, becomes uh-huh. vice president, becomes president. And that's kind of how I got through the thing. And the, the thing with codes and all, when I went to Atlanta, Greater Atlanta board meetings, I'm, again, I don't, I'm not laying down for the county county. We need to fight them. They're wrong. They're wrong. And everybody seemed to appreciate that and have pushed me forward. And uh, I'm chairman of the Builder Action Fund, which is there to sue counties and cities for both Atlanta and for the state of Georgia. So anyway. Wow. Well, talk a little bit about government affairs. You know, government you- affairs is basically it's, it's dealing dealing with and networking with, and it's a it's a cousin relationship with the counties and cities, kind of keep an eye on them, make sure they're not going off the track in the wrong direction. Also be an assistance to them when they need help. Because again, most of these county commissioners or city council, they don't know anything about construction. They don't want to know anything. They want people they can trust and who can make sense to them and explain it to them. Right. And government, part of government affairs function is to do that, be that person and, and I pick them in Cherokee County. Cherokee County's got an issue. They, I usually get a phone call mm-hmm. from the chairman. George, what do you think about this? Are we going in the right direction? What do we need to change? And then they listen because I've been doing it for enough years. They know I'm going to tell them what I think is fact. And I usually know the facts and I try to be truthful about it. Yeah. And that's what government affairs should be, should do. And the main thing it does is keep up with it, what's going on. Because some, some commissioner or city council person will have a neighbor who thinks they've been fouled and they, they'll want to change the whole rules for one exception. Mm-hmm. That seems to be the biggest problem. They want to change the whole world for one exception where my philosophy is leave the rules in place, adjust for the exception, handle it by itself. And that's part of what government affairs is about. Yeah. Also, also part of government affairs is making sure the bill right there in the field knows what the, what's happening to him in the county offices, meaning they change the code and the builder doesn't know it. They don't put an announcement out or anything. They just do it at a meeting and you're stuck. Mm-hmm. So it's keep you informed. Yeah. Surprise. Yeah. Surprise, um, surprise. So talk a little bit about your favorite development. You've mentioned Town Lake and you've mis- mentioned Summer Chase. Um, you know, Summer, Town Lake, Town Lake, I was one of the on the front end when it was still just raw land. Mm-hmm. It's 4,000 acres. And I, wor- I worked with the Johnson Group to help them get it rezoned and replan plan. And part of my reward for that was buying the southwest corner of it, Summer Chase, Rose Creek, and Wellesley. And Summer Chase, that's where I live. I'm real, really proud of it. it uh, this is 80s, and I mm-hmm. play 80s, okay? And we, we, we had a vision, this subdivision, to, for really truly middle class America, even upper middle class. And we design every house is four bedrooms. Every house has a basement. Every house is hooked up for office in a house. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And we, we have five, the, the fiber optic, all that. We had all that for anybody else in the area did. And uh, we, you know, the, the CAD 5, whatever they call it, we did, we did all that. And That's impressive. What's, what's nice about it is most of my neighbors work from home mm-hmm. still. And they, they like it here. And it's in it town like it's, it was a tough fight fighting the, the not my backyard people. NIMBYs don't want it next door to them. But right. no, it's really self contained, got kind of our own ex- exit on 575. And if you don't go to town lake, you don't have to know it's even there. Right. But uh, I was flying, I'm a pilot. And I was flying over at the area looking and you had all, all at night, you got all these lights and you come up on town lake. It's just dark. 
Mm-hmm. It's just raw land. So that's where the growth needs to go. So it uh, it worked out well. Everybody's real proud of it. We got schools, libraries, everything. And, it, and the developers, the developer and the sub-developers like that, we all work together for the benefit of our customer. Yeah. And, well, you built a little city, really. No, we, exactly. It, uh-huh. it, we looked at put, incorporating it into a city or putting it with nah, we don't need to do that. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. Got everything, everything you want right here. That's phenomenal. Well, you also built a new American home in oh, Atlanta. Yeah. Talk yeah. a little bit about that. Where is that house? And what does that house look like? And what year was that, if you remember? Uh, I think 1990. Okay. New American, new, the New American Home Program is put on by the National Association of Home Builders. And it's built as a show house, model home for brand new, not even on the market yet, products for the manufacturers to kind of show up what's coming. And it's built for the national convention for your, for the builders to come look at, okay? And we got sort of recruited to build it. And we built it in Cobb County, Arden Lake, one of my, one of my actually Arden Trace, excuse me, Arden Lake was the first one, Arden Trace was the second subdivision I did in Cobb County. And uh, it's kind of a Victorian style house. Hmm. Uh, one of the things that is kind of weird about it is that uh, at nighttime, you turn the basement lights on, it's got a glass block ribbon all the way around. It looks like it's floating on, on lights. Oh, interesting. It looks like, it looks like a spaceship. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, it makes me but, want to go by and look at it. Something the architect wanted. But, yeah. Uh, but we had the computer, whole house computer lights. You could control the temperature and everything. All that technology was just emerging back then. And we yeah. were putting it in the house. Some of it worked, some of it didn't. <laughs> uh, I learned a lot about how the process works. One of the things I learned, there's a disconnect between the manufacturer and the builder in the field. Mm-hmm. And I, people said, what do you mean by that? And I said, I'll give you a good example. Flooring company came out with a new flooring design, hardwood flooring designed specifically for the kitchen. We put it in like we normally, okay, no problem. Then I'm reading the directions. You can't put water on it. For a kitchen? For a kitchen. Makes a lot of sense. Not. Makes no sense. Number one spot. Where does most people put the bowl of water for their pet? In the, in the kitchen, kitchen floor. floor. Yeah. That's right. Yep. The other thing was we wrote, we put the refrigerator in, which is the last thing you put in the house, but they're sliding yep. and it marred up, marred the floor. You see the tracks. And then the manufacturer said, well, you're not supposed to, you're supposed to go in last. The hardwood, like, how are you going to put the hardwood floor in the refrigerator? Is that? So we had. Oh, we don't know. The engineer didn't know. The other issue was a refrigerator was one of these flush top mount refrigerators, okay, side by side. And, and to, until up to that time, every refrigerator electrical cord is in the bottom middle of the, the wall. They put this one up high with a two foot cord on it. They wouldn't reach anything. So we had to improvise. Had to move your that. electrical, yeah. <laughs> wow. And That's then I got, crazy. Yeah, and I got called, I still do, I get called in for focus groups, different manufacturers, and primarily because I don't pull punches, like I know one uh, plumbing fixture faucets the manufacturer called me, I went to one of their things, and they wanted to know why did their product, I said, because it's ugly, it's the best made, but it's ugly, it's nobody ugly. wants yeah. it, I can't give it away, and they've yeah. changed their, they've changed their product line to make it competitive now, right, yeah, yeah. Well, sometimes you, you know, can't be scared to tell somebody that their baby's ugly. Uh, That's part of my problem. I do that. No, no filter, huh? (laughs) I tell the truth, whatever it is. What gets me out of that trouble is that same is true. Right. Yeah. 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 Honesty goes a long way. Yeah. Well, what has been the most rewarding part of your career? I don't. I don't know. Working with people. Yeah, people. I think we've heard that a lot from our legends, helping people, helping them to get the acquire the American dream. Yep. And helping builders. Yep. A lot of builders thank me for 
I'm sure they have. You have helped a lot of builders in many, many ways for many, many, many years. And it's kind of funny. I, I, I will share this with you because you'll chuckle. Um, when I decided to interview, I'm like, well, George isn't online. What has he done? And so I asked a couple of people, hey, do you know George McClure? Well, of course, he's always around. He's he's this, he's that. And, you know, people know what you've done with codes and know what you've done in government affairs and that I'm like, well, you know, well, what else has he done? They're like, well, I don't know. He's just always been here. Mm -hmm. So it's just been interesting. You know, you've been the go-to for so many people. And those of us who are, you know, when you talked about building the new American home, that was probably, that was probably working in the industry, but I hadn't gotten involved in the HBA. Um, I never attended a builder show here in Atlanta. You know, my first yeah. one was in Orlando. I've only been to Orlando or IBS because I started going, I guess, about 2005. And I think you said you built the new American home, you know, in the in 1990s. Yeah. So, you know, I, I missed all of that. But, you know, you look at, you know, kind of my generation, which, you know, we're, we're not the youngsters in the industry anymore. You know, yeah. we're not in the, we're, we're now the ones, I mean, heaven forbid. Y'all replacing looking. me. Yeah, we're the ones that are, and I refuse to say this, we're turning 50 something now, right? Yeah, yeah wow. I had somebody on a call yesterday say, oh, well, yeah, the Gen Xers are all turning 55 and can live in the active adult communities. I'm like, no, I'm still 36. I'm just going to keep wow, lying. For, but, um, but, you know, I've known who you are the entire time I've been in the industry, but, you know, I don't know how actively you've been building since I've been in the industry. Because I know you confessed you're semi-retired, but that means yeah. you still have projects going on. Yes, yeah. I'm on the Cherokee County Airport Authority. Oh, and wow. We're building we're a big addition to our runway and expansion up there. I'm past chairman of it. And uh, and I have some property close by that we're, we're getting ready to, to develop. And then I've now, got commercial to develop. Do you still fly? I, no, I was, uh, I have a problem with vertigo. Mm, yeah. I, I grounded myself. Right. You don't, you, you drive a car with vertigo, you pull over on the side of the road. You Hard. can't you can't fly land an airplane with vertigo. So so I'm um, so my plane and said that's it, I'm done. Yeah. But, yeah, I'm I am um, I'm 73 years old. That's long enough. Yeah. My dad uh used to fly. I grew up flying in the backseat of a Beechcraft debonair. Okay. So uh it gave yeah. me a very good inoculation against any kind of air sickness as it relates to turbulence because exactly. big planes don't feel like that little plane did. No, they don't. <laughs> no. Yeah. One thing I get back to about one of my rewarding things is when I was president of Atlanta, I tried to make every chapter every other month. It's nine chapters. Oh, wow. Yeah. And That's a lot. Every, That's a commitment. Well, it's not that big a deal. It, uh, most of them had dinner meetings back then. Mm -hmm. And uh, I learned a long time ago that it's real simple. Be there, be seen, be gone. Get to the meeting, see everybody, talk to everybody, and then sneak out. Don't, sneak out. Knows when, I can't sneak into a room. Everybody knows I'm there. But you but can, can sneak, sneak out. out. <laughs> you never don't want to leave. You know, they don't know. But Famous that, word. That, that year, a lot of I, I closed a lot of meetings after the meeting in a parking lot, sitting on pickup truck tailgates, talking with builders. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, what advice do you have? you know, for one of these youngsters out there that's looking to get into the building industry, you know, whether it's starting for themselves or even going to work for someone else, you know. I'll tell you what, I, I get that. I get asked that question a lot. What, 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 what should I do? Builders who, mm -hmm. who find themselves out of business and can't get, can't get loans anymore. Yeah. Or they bankrupted or they're trying, are there new starts or I'm telling the same story, find a niche and work, be the best in that niche. And the niche, I think, is, a, is an aging in place niche. Mm -hmm. the, 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 you mentioned the, you know, the 55 and older stuff. I'm amazed that you go in these 55 and older home subdivision, and they're three-story buildings. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. Who are you kidding? Right. Okay. Right. And, you know, we got our elevator. Shit. Yeah. Well, who's going to have the 30 grand to spend for an elevator, you know, 10 years from now? Right. And design it on a front end. I'm not saying it has to be the full-blown handicap accessible. The handicap donate, I built several of those houses. I built houses where we had to pipe in oxygen, okay? Right, oh, wow. Yeah, with hospital beds, the whole bit. Mm -hmm. I get the jobs nobody else wants, <laughs> the difficult ones. But there's grab, grab bars and the showers, the toilets, the doorways. And if you could either build them that way, okay, on the front end, but the real market is an aftermarket for that right 
steps, go to town lake. Four uh, four thousand, ten thousand houses or something like that, and every one of them's got front steps. Mm-hmm. Every one of them mm-hmm. it may just be two or three, but two or three. If you're in a wheelchair, you can't make it. Right. So it, uh, I, that's the yeah. mark to go in. Well, I you know, and even they, yeah, even just you know, making sure that you've you know used all the wider doorways and that you've facilitated, you've right. you've built the bones so that right. the house yeah. can easily. Yeah, that's for the builder, but also if you're the if you're the remodeling, that's where the market is because you're using the customer's capital instead of your own borrowing money, or whatever. Right. You use your talents, et cetera. And, you know, walk in showers, grab b- r- st- stairways, all that stuff. Okay. Yeah. Well, and the reality is, you know, we've now got, well, I mean, you know, we've got the Gen Xers now turning, you know, 50, 55, uh, getting up there. So we've got, you know, several large generations that are starting to age in place and, you know, look for what they're going to do in the future. And, you know, we're all living longer. So I've got a buddy builder, buddy of mine faced with that problem. What does he do? I told him that and he, he went up to Blue Ridge, Georgia, up there to one of the little communities up there, did one house. He's still there two years later. <laughs> Yeah, everybody like, just keeps referring him, I bet. Everybody yep. sees what he's doing and he just he's still there. Yeah. He might not ever get I mean, that's not a terrible place to end up. No, it's not it's bad. Beautiful at all. up there. Yeah, well, exactly. Off air, you told me that you have a nephew that's in the business now. Yep. Or yeah. Just graduated from How- college and uh uh he went to work for North Georgia Brick. Yeah, a little over a month. Yeah, it sells and uh, we'll see how he does. So do you think that being around you his whole life influenced his desire to go into the building industry? I don't know. I, they've, they've, we don't talk about it a lot. Okay. My sons do. My sons both grew up in the business. And, and I wanted them to have, learn a trade. Mm-hmm. And they both did. They neither one of them are using that trade, but they're both very active. Uh, and then my grandchildren, my, my attitude is, my son's job is to teach them. And then I try to teach them hands-on kind of things when physically I do things. And then I've been, I've, uh, the business of building, it is a business. And I have, fo- I have focused on more on knowing the business side of it versus the trade part of it. Right. When I came up, started out framing houses, driving nails, stone plywood. It was a physical part, the, the building of the house that has evolved that your market is going to be somewhere in the business side. And I've helped them with that a lot. Yeah. Well, now are your sons in the business? No, I have one of my oldest son is a senior vice president of SAP software. The world's largest software company. Great. Bro- yeah. Great company. Yeah. And sales. He, he's a super salesman kind of guy. And my, my youngest son, he works for the company and he's the head construction guy, A and D development company. And they do big, a hardscape entrances, the outside landscape, that kind of thing for hospitals, schools. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. So he's in the building industry, just not he residential. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and he, he is, his uh, in training, if you will, working with me was in brick laying and masonry. He liked that part. He's right. Six six, weighs two forty. He's a big guy. My other son, he likes to be a salesman. He wanted to be. Mm-hmm. A, he learned to be a trim carpenter. Ah. So, so he says, you're always got a roof over your head and it's always, you can always bring a heater in, be, be warm. Mm-hmm. There you uh, go. He's, he's evolved in this. He's still, uh, matter of fact, he did a little trim work for me not too long ago. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Well, talk a little bit about your current projects. I know you said that you're just semi-retired. You have a couple of things going on. So what are they? I've got a little piece of uh, residential property that I'm in the process of putting in part of a, a package and to develop as commercial. Okay, we're, we're working on that right now. That's in process. Uh, and then uh, there's two other pieces, my piece, two other pieces, put them together, make a deal. And then the other piece is part of the, uh, the county's expansion at the airport, not what I'm involved in, but the roadway, the access is behind the airport and some other parts of it.
Hey, Austin, you back with us? I'm back now. That was weird. It was. I don't know if we're still recording. I think it's still recording, but I will have to back up just a little bit to right before that happened. All right. Well, All right. now it started back. Now it started back. Do you know where we fell off? It's hard to say because of because I lose you before. I know. Like, it gets sketchy before then. It's hard to hear what you guys are saying. Um, well, he was talking about current projects. Yeah. Can we just go back to maybe go back to that question? Yeah. Do sure you mind repeating, I... George? Sorry. I don't mind. I don't mind. Okay. All right. It looks stable now, so let's give it a shot. All right. Thank you, Comcast. <laughs> So you mentioned that you're only semi-retired and you have a couple of current projects going on. Um, can you right. share with us what those are? One, I'm putting together a part of an assembly to three different pieces of property uh, that are currently zone residential that we're going to put package as a commercial piece. And, and we're finishing up the due diligence on that and looking to go, to, go in for zoning next month and don't see a big problem there. Uh, we're working on that. And then I've got uh, I've got five acres of industrial property up at the Cherokee County Airport exit, and we're working and working with the county about either developing the industrial or part of the airport. Uh, and then I'm talking to a buddy of mine who's actually kind of tied in with the airport property. We're talking about buying a piece of property, 100 acres of land, something like that, and maybe dividing it up in like 30 acre lots. Ooh, that'd be fun. Uh huh. Fun. And then try to sell maybe one lot a year or something mm -hmm. like that, or or take the thirty acres uh, and instead of one lot, make it four lots or something like that. Oversized big lots. Mm -hmm. Nothing where we got to worry about all the other stuff. Right, that's exciting. Yeah, it could be. It just keeps us busy. Yeah, keeps yeah. you busy, keeps you young. Keeps me keeps me busy. Reason to keep up with everything. Absolutely. Yep. Well, anything I haven't asked you that I should have asked you. Uh, or anything no. else you want to add it's a tough business uh you, it's a, one of my bankers over the years he said mcclure you know you're just a legalized professional gambler <laughs> and that's, that's true. true that is true and that song kenny rogers song guy know when to hold them know when to fold them is very very true mm -hmm. the last recession wiped out a lot of builders because didn't sure know when did. to fold them absolutely a couple of them folded quickly and survived same time our egos getting away mm -hmm. i tell all new builders i give them all the same advice don't build what you like build, build what, what sells yeah exactly yep do mistake don't let your wife decorate it <laughs> we see that happen too you're absolutely oh, dead on on that hire a professional Mm -hmm. And this isn't a hobby. This is this in person is business. Absolutely. Keep it that, keep it that way. And yeah. Uh, but like I said, the biggest thing right now in the marketplace, what's going on is find that niche for you. Mm -hmm. And work and work that know more about that niche than any again, know more about anybody else. No other rules, know what works. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I get a lot of phone calls from remodelers who don't know what the code is. Oh, good grief. Yeah, they're doing a code book and they don't know, and they're trying to make a living. If that's your living, you all know more about anybody. Right. Yeah. So. Absolutely. Well, for our listeners who want more information on you or the builders out there who might want to, you know, give you a call and get some advice, how can people reach you? Uh, my email has been the same for the whole time. It's McClure, M C C L U R E G at bellsouth.net. My sales 404-558-1722. And it's been the same number all the way through. I don't have a web page. I never did a web page for me. Mm -hmm. I've always done web pages for the projects. You won't see my name on the monument sign. It's the name of the subdivision on the monument sign. Market this product, not me. Yep. And, uh, it seems to work. I like it has it. worked very well for you. I think so. I think so. Absolutely. So, or, want, or somebody wants to call, be glad to help them out. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your time today. My pleasure. It's been fun. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Well, with that, this is a wrap for this week's okay. Atlanta Real Estate Forum Radio's All About Real Estate Edition. I want to thank George McClure for joining me in studio today. Thanks, George. You're welcome. Thank you. 
On behalf of our show sponsor, Denim Marketing, I'm your host, Carol Morgan. Thank you for tuning in today. If you enjoyed today's show, then please head over to iTunes and give us a positive rating and review. There's lots of opportunities to follow and interact with us. You can download and listen to our shows for free on iTunes, Stitcher, and Spotify. And lots of our episodes are on YouTube. So go to our YouTube page and click on that little notification bell to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. If you're interested in being on the show or being a show sponsor, reach out to me, carol at denimmarketing.com. Um, thank you for listening. I look forward to seeing you right here for our next episode. Atlanta Real Estate Forum Radio is made possible by Denim Marketing, the publisher of Atlanta Real Estate Forum, Atlanta's favorite source for real estate and home building news. Denim Marketing is a comfortable fit, like your favorite pair of jeans. Denim Marketing tailors marketing strategies to meet your specific needs and niche. Try them on for size. They will work to create a perfect fit for your company's marketing program. Call them at 770-383-3360 or send an email to info at denimmarketing.com. For more information on Atlanta Real Estate Forum Radio or to inquire about being a guest, contact info at atlantarealestateforum.com. Check out the radio show by visiting atlantarealestateforum.com or by listening to the show on your favorite podcast app. And if you enjoyed today's broadcast, we'd sure appreciate a rating and review on iTunes. Thank you again for listening. And we'll see you next time on Atlanta Real Estate Forum Radio.